Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just we just thought we'd organize it thematically, so we also weren't jumping around too much if we have to pass a mic. Um, do you? Um, we can we can project some images here. Is that going to work uh, um, visually for you? We can also turn out these lights if that helps. Um, Turning out the lights would be on desk or anything. Okay. Uh, And if you want to go for the intro, uh, we're just getting set up, but that can be part of the show. <laughs> okay, sounds good. The lights and yeah, you can probably keep the lights on in that part of the room, or maybe not. Does this give you enough light to? Uh... Um, yeah, I, mean, I might. I might just come. Yeah, this is oh, fine. This is fine. Okay. All righty, folks. Well, I'm just going to say a few words of welcome. Uh, thanks again for your patience getting started a little bit uh, later this Monday morning. Um, always a bit of complications post weekend, <laughs> powder outages, etc. But thanks so much for joining us today for our live lab walk. Today, we were joined by Associate Professor in Anthropology and Sociology, Craig he Hetherington. Um, as, he <laughs> <that's you. laughs> as he shows us around Concordia's Ethnography Lab. Craig is the lab's director and a political anthropologist specializing in environment, infrastructure, and the bureaucratic state. So on that note, I'm happy to pass it over to you. Craig, welcome. Uh, hi. Well, welcome welcome to you. Um, maybe I'll just start by saying this is this is the lab. Um, it's, a, it's a rather large space. You can uh, come around. Um, we don't, we share it with several other groups. So, uh, so we have um, X modal over here. We have machine agencies that hangs out in here, and the bio lab. Um, we're all part of a, a research cluster called Speculative Life in the in the Meijer Institute. Um, and uh, and the idea, and maybe I'll, I'll also introduce. You'll get to speak to them in a minute. But uh, we have Melina here, Hanin here, and uh, Valérie over here, who are active members of our student steering committee um, in the lab. Um, and, and maybe I can just say a couple of things about why we did this. So we, we inaugurated the lab in, uh, I think it was 2015, I guess I should figure that out, um, in, uh, in the hopes of trying to think ethnography differently. So ethnography is this, uh, is this tradition of researching in immersed kind of social spaces uh, that, uh, that's been very, uh, very central to anthropology and sociology for a long time. Um, and what we wanted to do was to think about, kind of think outside of the box of what traditional ethnography was. And part of doing that was to open a space where we could get together and just have fun trying to think of different ways. So, so there were sort of three ways that we, that we thought about ethnography changing. One was that it's always been very social and very text-based. Um, and by coming here, being surrounded by artists um, and designers and folks like that, we were trying to open up ways of thinking about ethnography uh, materially, what the materials of ethnography could be. Um, another thing we wanted to do ethnography is traditionally, at least in anthropology, has been very uh, solo uh, sort of thing. You can kind of imagine that classic colonial image of the person who goes out to some other part of the world and hangs out with folks that are different from themselves and then tries to learn from that. Um, and we wanted to think of ways to, to bring people together and to collaborate on ideas more. Um, so, so putting us in a lab was one way of doing that. And the other way that, uh, that a lab sort of changes or challenges the notion of ethnography is to get us out of the field as this kind of site that you always have to be in. So ethnography has tended to be very based on locations and places, um, but by putting it in a lab and sort of throwing people's uh, perspectives around in a different way, um, we hope to kind of open things up. So that's what we did. Um, we got a bunch of students together and, um, and we, we hang out here, we devise projects. They still happen outside of the lab. So we don't have a lot of equipment or anything to show you here, um, but we have this space where we, that we, we get together and have all these discussions in. Um, and the one last thing I wanted to show you before I uh, hand it over to Melina is this table that we built here, um, uh, just as kind of a, 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 a symbol of what we're doing here. So this was the first thing that happened when we opened the lab um, a bunch of students who had no knowledge of carpentry whatsoever decided to get into the spirit, they would build a table out of materials that they found everywhere. And this becomes kind of symbolically our gathering spot and the way that we get real about material and the material of space and the material of sociality and so on 
Um, and so we're, we're this, this big, heavy, slightly uneven thing is very much, uh, is very dear to us uh, as we go forward. So uh, we can come back. I'll, I'll show you some of our projects later, but I wanted to uh, introduce you first to, uh, to Melina who had some things to say. And I should also say, if anyone's got any questions to, to jump in at any point. Oh, I, I guess I need to give you a mic. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here, you can see it too. There we go. Are you going to sit there? Are you going to sit there? Thank you. Okay, so shall we? Okay. Well, uh, thank you. So as Craig mentioned, the idea of the lab is uh, in a way to engage with innovative of doing ethnography. And that is actually what um, brought me to uh, Concordia, uh, the possibility of uh, working here, especially because I'm interested in uh, multi-species ethnography, which in a way um, takes ethnography as it was known uh, for years uh, to like a new boundary, which is engaging with non-humans or with uh, things like uh, the table. So I joined uh, the lab to uh, par take part in the waterways um, project, which is a project that deals with water uh, in different uh, forms in Montreal. So it's, uh, it would be like rivers or sewage or snow. And I started working in that project uh, when I was uh, in Costa Rica because of COVID. So it was uh, very interesting to do an ethnography of something I wasn't even experiencing myself. Uh, so, well, I, I wrote a, a little blog about it, and now I'm kind of down, now that I'm here, I'm continuing to think uh, with snow and how I want to deal uh, in my relationship uh, with it. And yeah, so this afternoon we have a meeting, we're going to sit in this table, we're going to talk about new water objects that we're going to engage with um, this year. And uh, that thing that Craig mentioned about uh, working collaboratively is uh, very important because we work in teams. It's not that I do this and this other person do that, but we work as a team and in sub teams. So we think about those objects together. And then I want to mention uh, some training that we are doing as part of the lab, which is um, decolonizing um, research training. And we are getting trained by a team of uh, Mexican uh, people uh, that are in Chiapas about how to subtract ourselves from the research. And even if it sounds super interesting and amazing, when you really want to put that into practice, it's you don't really know where to start. Because as Craig mentioned, uh, the ethnography was something where you were always the protagonist, the person who went to Madagascar and thought about you know how they did things, how they ate breakfast and that type of thing. And of course, ethnography is beyond that a lot. So it's really a challenge, and but the lab gives us kind of that space to think together and think differently. So, I will try to figure out how to place this. <laughs> Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So as Melina was talking and telling us about uh, her experience in the lab, actually, the lab is a space where I can be myself creatively and freely. And as cliche as, as that may sound to some, um, when I first became a member of the lab, it was my first semester at Concordia. And it was my first real anthropology course because my undergrad was in two different disciplines. I wasn't sure about what to bring the, to the table. I was really nervous and I was doubting myself. I wasn't too confident in my skills. And it's actually Craig who told me that uh, everyone brings something important to the table. And especially if their background is from something else because uh, things are not done traditionally here. Things are done in as creatively as possible. So when we imagine a field, I typically tend to imagine a sepia filter placed all over uh, an old image. But this is not what our fields are here at the ethnography lab. 
And also when we imagine ethnography, we tend to think of it as a textual thing, the object being the participant observation that we take field notes on and everything. Of course, we still do take field notes. But for instance, I'll give you an example of um, one of our working groups. One of our working groups is called GPS. And GPS stands for Gameplay Space. So Gameplay Space is one of the uh, co-working spaces in Montreal that we're studying. And basically, it's a community-driven co-working space for um, studios, video game designers, and people who don't have their own actual studio. So they can receive their mail there, they can socialize, they can network, and they can uh, out to outsource their skills that they're lacking from their team. So GPS uh, or the GPS working group has taught me um, to look at things in a, from a creative lens, to do things differently. And studying uh, video game designers made me think about the product, the end product that's going to be um, our project once we finish this, this work. And I wasn't sure what I wanted it to be because I don't want it to be in some journal. I don't want it to be a blog. And I decided to join a two day uh, weekend game jam and I decided to make my own game. So it influenced me to think in different ways I could present my research. And what do you know, our game actually won an award and it was amazing. Um, the game uh, is basically doing ethnography on a train. So it takes us from the protagonist who uh, is doing participant observation and then is telling us what they see basically. And of course it was fiction in that regard, but this is a creative way that we could think about presenting our research uh, or ethnographies and um, forgetting the text basically. Yes. Uh, maybe I'll just hold it for a second until we, uh, until we figure out where we're, where we're going next. So one thing, uh, one thing I did think we could just show you, and then we could go to, to some questions and open up the discussion a little bit, is one of the projects that we've done. Um, I'll, I'll put it up on our, our screen here, which is just a wall. But uh, um, so we, uh, there's been this one big project since the beginning that, um, that we, we felt that we needed to have a project in the lab that was going to kind of have a a long life to it and it was going to be collaborative um, and so what that became was what we call the Montreal Waterways Project which is basically every year we get a group of students together to think about um, different ways of imagining water in the city um, and then different ways of representing water in the city. So we've, we've done a whole bunch of different what we call water objects. So thinking about the materiality of water in different kinds of ways. But one of them that um, is uh, at least sort of visually easy to, to capture is a project that students did on what they call the Ghost St. Pierre River. So if you, if you look at the, uh, the screen here, we have this, this interactive map they made of a river that is no more. It's a river that used to go through Montreal um, and is now, is now underground mostly. Um, mostly it's in sewers, um, but it has a whole bunch of different ways that it interacts with the city. So you can find, you can find these kind of remnants. What we did was we looked at these different, um, uh, it's a little slow this morning. Um, we looked at these different remnants that help you to understand what water is in the city. This is contamination or the, what happens to the bottom of the uh, Lachine Canal. After it gets drained, you can kind of think about the sludge and you can think about the history, the industrial histories of Montreal through that. Um, but one of, the, one of the interesting things is then thinking about how that might be connected to something like, um, to something like this uh, legal battle that's been going on. Is it gonna load? Um, this legal battle that's been going on in Montreal West over sewage contamination in a golf course um, and, and normally, and we found people all along the, all along this old river who know about these little controversies, but don't think of their connection and don't think of the water that's running between them. And that's uh, connecting them to these histories of the, of the city. So if you look at this, this ghost river map, which you can find on our website, you can see all kinds of different, um, different little fragments of the water, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, are, are still kind of possible to interact with in the landscape. And then what we also did was we, um, 
uh, we had different ways to represent this river. So one of the weird things that happens when a river goes underground is that it gets it gets diverted and it gets canalized. And so when we decided to start looking for it, we actually had a lot of trouble deciding where it was or what it was we were even looking at. So we made different maps with different possibilities um, to think about uh, to think about the river and to think about the river as what we would call a multiple, an object multiple, right? Something that actually has many different ways of being in the world and that you want to interact with in different kinds of ways. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would just say about this project, um, unless anyone has any questions about it, is that, uh, that it, it sort of um, embodies the kind of ethnography we're talking about, where on the one hand, we're still looking at the social life um, in a classic sense, of something important that's going on in a, in a landscape or in a city. On the other hand, we're also kind of interacting with it in a way that brings it to life in a different kind of, in a different kind of sense. So it's past looking, but it's also future looking. It's looking towards possibilities. It's looking towards different ways of, of thinking about, um, about social lives in the city. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I wanted to show you. If, uh, if you got any questions, um, we'll, we'll pass this between us depending on uh, whose expertise is more required. How would you describe that in this context where the object is something that is sort of often immaterial or kind of beyond your reach? The participants aren't all human, although some of them are. So how does, how does that get an expanded definition in this project? Do you want to uh, take a shot at that? Okay. Well, I, I think that is a really good question, and it's something that, in my opinion, anthropologists uh, have not really, you know, come up with a good or bad answer to it. You know, it's, it's more about how, how you engage with your uh, field, and this is maybe I, I can tell you a little bit more about my um, experience with snow because I think I was a very in a way, even sad, if you want, of not being able to be in the field because I could I could not sense it, you know. So I couldn't feel the cold. I couldn't feel, you know, my boots walking in the snow, and I couldn't feel all that I was supposed to be feeling when I wasn't studying snow. So I could read as much as I wanted. I could interview as many people as I wanted on Zoom because the interviews we were doing were in Zoom anyway, either we were in Montreal or not, but this kind of being with is what uh, I would say is the, for me, the most important part of uh, doing ethnography materially. So yeah, that, that is, I don't know if Craig wants to add something, but for me is uh, engaging with the sensation. Yeah, I, I can just, uh, I'll, I'll add one little thing to that, which is just to say, participant observation traditionally has always been supposedly about you know full-on participation in a particular kind of space but it has tended to be very textual and very discursive so it's tended to be what can i describe and what can i ask people about and get some kind of textual feedback on um, and uh, that has been shaken up in a whole bunch of different ways so one of the ways has been through this kind of sensory ethnography thinking more about how one's reacting or interacting with different kinds of things in the landscape, um, including people, right? And sort of thinking about their senses and our senses. Um, but then also uh, thinking about relations more widely. So we often think about the social or, or traditionally in our disciplines, we think of social relations as how do people relate to each other? Um, but as soon as we open that up and say, well, actually we relate to all kinds of things that aren't people, how do we interrogate those, whether it's through different kinds of sensory engagements or embodiment in general, or the affective, the emotional, all those kinds of things become a really important part of how to, uh, of how to open this up. And then it gives you access to thinking about the material in all kinds of different ways. So. about video game design and thinking about how to translate experiences and so it seems like uh, the more technologies that you bring in and the different tools that you work with allow you to communicate the sensory experience in a way that maybe in previous areas of the field wasn't possible. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I'll, I'll give this to Hanin in a second to, to talk about this but if you think about the history of ethnography one of the the groups that was really really good at this early on was filmmakers right and even they were marginalized from 
um, the kind of textual based uh, anthropology or sociology that was really about getting your peer reviewed article out or your, your monograph book, right? Whereas filmmakers always understood that there was so much more going on in the presentation of these things. So I think with the, the, the expansion of the kinds of media that are available to us, that's part of what we wanted to um, open up in the lab. And I'm certainly not an expert in this, um, but one of, the, one of the, the great things about being in this space is that we can bring inter, interdisciplinary collaborators in who are experts in that and who can help us to think about these modes of presentation that are a little bit different from the textual. Absolutely. So when uh, I think about a material object, for instance, whether it's the table or it's a software or whether it's the river as well, I think about it in terms of embodied experiences. So I don't think about it just as in me observing the object itself, but what the object uh, brings in terms of the past people who uh, encountered it, the past people who uh, worked through it, what does it mean? So my supervisor actually uh, says this really nice uh, quote that um, you can write a book and not have no one read it or you can uh, make a film and have no one watch it but they'll still be there but if you make a video game you can't make a video game that isn't played because the main point of a video game is to be played so if you make a video game and no one plays it it's just a software so um this is uh something that i i think about so it, it also depends on what we put from ourselves into the software or into the film, what we uh, know about it from other people and other people's experiences, expressions, um, lived embodiments and all of that. So yeah, uh, you wanna add something? And, and in that sense, um, there are so many possibilities, like you don't have to be a filmmaker, you don't have to be a game designer to engage with creativity in your ethnographic practices, because also if we are trained um, in anthropology and all of the sudden and we're used to write all the time and all of the sudden we think we have to produce a video game that could be absolutely daunting, right? But it's more about how we engage with uh, any cre creative means like this table and I think Canada is a great place for that. There's a lot of um, thinking and producing of uh, experimental and imaginative ethnographies. And actually that's why I wanted to come to Canada. And for instance, in one of um, the classes that we took, uh, I, uh, I was engaging with relations. I was also doing multi-species ethnography because also during COVID, it was great. I didn't have to interview people. You know, I, I was interviewing my surroundings and so I didn't have to talk. Uh, to anyone and I um, was criticizing uh, the kind of the Victorian science approach to nature in Costa Rica that is followed uh, by the tourist industry right so what I did is that I bought this postcard and I started I made some holes on it and I used my threads and I started to bring connections between the different um, things in the postcard to show that they were um, connections, they were relations. And it's a way, in a way also, as Craig says, to propose different imaginaries and possibilities and futures. So sometimes also I feel like being in a place like this where everyone is an artist and all of a sudden what you do is basically write could be really daunting, but there are many ways to approach ethnography in a creative way, even writing can be creative in a different way. We can write differently as uh, people did in, in the past in anthropology. So, and that is what we want to engage people uh, with in the lab. Thanks. I guess it sort of naturally leads us into the, the kind of concept of this interdisciplinarity. Um, I really appreciate that like the, the table as like a platform for interaction has been so central in our conversation. Thinking about the video game too, and I'm, I'm curious about also how having a really interdisciplinary team changes the way that you imagine other audiences interacting with the research and interaction as sort of a, a success metric almost the way you're describing it. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's great. Me so. As, as someone who is trained in a very disciplinary version of what academia is um, as well, this, this has been really eye-opening for me um, and been really one of the most rewarding things about this. So I think, uh, I, I think there's a couple of things that happen. Um, one, of the, 
one of the impulses for starting the lab was the recognition that even though anthropology and sociology in particular as disciplines, because we have such a long history with the word ethnography, we tend to have a very, um, uh, a very guarded understanding of what it is, right? It's a tradition and you have to train in it in a particular way. But we also realized that there were more and more disciplines out there um, and creative practices that were using the word ethnography in all kinds of ways um, that perhaps were garnering greater audiences than our close disciplined um, versions of it, right? And so, so this was a way of saying, well, how do, we, how do we figure out what the space is between those, between this kind of loose, creative, wonderful sort of efflorescence of ethnography that's out there and this fairly rigorous tradition that we were we were uh, trained in um, to, to begin with. So that's that's why bringing together bringing us together in this space was was very much about that. Um, what it does, I would say, um, at least for for us who are who have this training that's bound in the tradition, it's just an immense loosening, right? Mm -hmm. It's sort of a giving away of some of the some of some of that rigidness of, of tradition in order to say what are all the possibilities that are opened up when you say well that doesn't matter and it doesn't matter if you've read this text and it doesn't matter if you um, have been able to quote that right now do I still have my moments where I'm like well hold on a second you know <laughs> ethnography isn't everything <laughs> because that's that's the, the thing that might happen right it's like people start to say well interacting with with uh, microbes in the lab, which we did. Um, we, we had lots of fun with Petri dishes at one point. Um, and I think it's an, an important question to reflect on of whether that can fall under a, 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 a particular tradition of knowledge making. Um, but what happens when we come here and when we bring people together is that we actually get to have those conversations in an open and interesting way where the direction we're going is always towards something creative and interesting and engaging rather than something that is going to conserve a tradition in a, in a particular kind of way. So, you know. oh, I just had a question yeah. about that, which is that when you, when you are kind of working with such expanded definitions and it seems like the the objects of study is so much beyond just the human. Um, where, where do you find yourself drawing the boundaries? Because I, I, I'm really drawn to what you just said about how it does at a certain point collapse usefulness if you don't define the parameters. But have, yeah. you, have you had points where you had to be like, this is no longer coming back into the field or? So I, the way that I negotiated that so far, and we'll have to see, like this is always a conversation, but the way that I negotiated is we still have our disciplines um, and I still practice a certain kind of pedagogy over in the hall building um, that really is based in this, what I, what I think of as a very valuable, rigorous tradition, right? And I, I teach that in a particular way. Um, having this space apart from that where we don't start from the question of what the boundaries are and actually start from the assumption that the boundaries are really malleable and that something comes from that um, allows us to be creative here. So for me, it, uh, and, I, and I think this is true of the students as well, who are going from the classes that we have in our disciplines into this space, um, it's not that you give up one for the other. It's just that the, the, kind, of, the kind of exciting creativity we're going for here is one that actually doesn't ask boundary questions very often. Um, it, they come up and we have interesting discussions around them, but we're not trying to set new boundaries. We're trying to say what happens when we start to move across them in, in, in different kinds of ways. And so that's why really it's a, it's a freeing space, right? Um, for, for people who are bound in this tradition. I just wanted to add one last thing about that. I think interdisciplinarity, uh, one of the main aspects for me for that, or the important aspects of that is uh, inclusivity and accessibility as well, because it leaves out less people. Of course, we're still leaving out people because we're in um, academia and an academic building and all, but it allows for more people who perhaps don't uh, cannot uh, quote the founding fathers of anthropology to you uh, directly to still participate in these creative ways of uh, doing ethnography, to still participate in the conversation, to still sit on this table with us and to collaborate with us. Do you want to add something? You, know, you were mentioning the training around kind of decolonizing ethnography and ethnographic practice and this idea of recognizing your own positionality does seem also very related to being able to invite people who aren't necessarily trained in the same way, like the kind of recognition that there's not a neutral position. 
Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I'll just say a couple of words and then uh, about this. I'm sure uh, they have more interesting things to say than me. But um, anthropology in particular has had this kind of relationship to colonialism that's been that's very deep and very problematic. And within our disciplines and within even you know even captured in the word ethnography is a particular kind of colonial practice that for a long time um, uh, anthropologists uh, and sociologists and others in that sort of similar traditions like human geographers and so on have been very aware of and have been trying to critique and trying to work their way out of. Um, so there's always been this kind of critical uh, move or what was first called post-colonialism and now is called decolonialism um, that uh, that I think was that I think was part of it, but as long as you stay steeped in the tradition, and as long as the tradition requires that you read these people who were not in any way critical of the colonial aspect of what they were doing, um, then I think there's only so far you can go with that. Now I'm not sure how far we've managed to make it in the lab. I think we've got a long way to go before we can really think about what it would mean to decolonize our practice here, for example. And that's not the only sort of form of inclusivity that we that we can and should work on as well. Um, but uh, but I, I think uh, I, I think it does allow us the space to think in more creative ways. So the the, the thing that Molina was talking about before about um, seeking out training in Mexico um, for a group here was one of the really interesting uh, ideas that came up for this year of just sort of saying, well, what happens with that? What happens epistemologically and practically when we um, when we try to shake things that way? Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on if you want to say more about that. Uh, actually, I don't have uh, lots to say about that because I think it's something that we are still learning how to do. And it's very, very, um, I, I don't know how to explain it. If you want to do it uh, right, it takes a lot. And even uh, this year when we started discussing waterways and engaging with the maybe decolonizing water, asking ourselves, how that is gonna look like and we don't know but that is also the beauty of the lab it's starting something that you don't know how it's gonna end i think uh, going back a bit to decolonizing anthropology and ethnography um i i like to uh think about it in the traditional sense there is a really exploitive and extractive aspect of doing ethnography from the way it was done in the past. And um, the people you are studying are not typically involved in the study afterwards, once it's published, once you start uh, reeling in uh, the benefits. And I think that that is um, one of the ways that I would change that, that I would decolonize anthropology is to, instead of looking at them as interlocutors or people who are benefiting me, I would look at them as collaborators, as people who are writing this with me. So uh, I'm not the sole owner or author of the manuscripts that I produce. I would be uh, someone who is equally benefiting uh, from this as them, which is knowledge production after all. I think it's it's really like pragmatic that there's so much that's kind of digitally based, but I'm, I'm curious just in the in producing the work about the, the kind of back and forth between an embodied experience of sight and these interpersonal relationships that you develop and these personal relationships to place and objects and materials. Um, and then they get translated into this kind of immaterial form a lot of the time, but I'm, I'm also curious if you ever have ways of presenting work that kind of bring other people into that embodied sensory relationship. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, I think, I mean, I think we still struggle with that. And I think in, in that way, uh, you know, that translation from an incredibly embodied immersive experience, this is, this is in sort of traditional ethnography, the, the, the immersiveness of participant observation transformed into text was always a really strange translation, right? And part of the art of that discipline was about figuring out how to do that in ways that were uh, that were less violent to the experience that you're trying to trying to describe. So I think I, I, uh, I think we still have to contend with that always. There's always this kind of act of translation between the moment of doing some sort of research and, and, and presentation. 
Um, but we have really tried to do all kinds of stuff. So some of the things we did last year and, and you won't see traces of them here because they don't have those kinds of traces, right? Um, we're doing walks together through the city, right? So actually presenting research um, in walk form or doing, uh, doing collaborative walks. This was partially sort of COVID mediated uh, thinking about um, what participant observation would be, but like trying to get outside with groups of people and reflect together on those kinds of things where the idea wasn't necessarily to produce anything but the experience itself. Um, and then there, there are other things that, uh, that, that come up along the way that have been, um, that have been surprising and immersive. The, the, the river project that I was just telling you about, for example, um, that I could get into a, a long story about it, but that, that piece of the golf course that I mentioned um, that's got some contamination is now being buried because of its contamination. And local residents are very uh, upset about that um, and held a funeral a couple of weeks ago that, uh, that the two of us went to um, in this kind of funeral for the river in which that will probably end up, um, or it has already ended up in some visual and textual forms. Um, but it was also just the experience itself of being there, of being part of that discussion with them that led, that led not only uh, the, the folks conducting the funeral to holding a funeral for a river, which is already pretty strange or a fairly radical act in itself, but that came out as much from the discussions that we've been having for years with them as it did, um, as it did anything else. So I think those sorts of, um, those sorts ex of experiences uh, along with the possibilities that we've explored only only a little bit, but um, but sort of uh, sensory um, uh, installations, uh, kinetic kinds of um, engagements that people have have uh, sometimes had performative uh, forms of representation are all things that are very much on the table, and that particularly when someone comes into the room who has a set of skills or a set of interests and they want to they want to go for it, then. Uh, then that's what we do. The other thing, um, along with games, there's someone else in the lab right now who wants to make a tabletop board game as a as a presentation of research about uh, uh, about certain kind of industry. And so, so we're we're always open and looking for for those kinds of engagements when they come along. But it's it's hard because um, in part because the medium you have to learn the new medium um, often every time that happens, and you have to kind of rethink what that translation is all about. And often when we're in this very multiple space of trying a lot of different things at once, a lot of those experiments, you know, they, they only sort of make it part way uh, to fruition. And we learn, all, we learn from them as we do it and we learn our other projects as we do it. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, 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 still, we're still learning. I don't know, did you want to say anything else about that? Yeah, just a little thing, because uh, that is also something, and I think uh, an event like this, let's say could be, open for that is that we don't have all the answers, but we want to have a space where people can come to look for them. So if you run a theater company and you said, you know, I want to do this, okay, come, you're welcome, you know? So it's because at the end of the day, we are just, you know, us, and we have our training, our skills, our projects, but the, the beauty is to have um, an open space for people to come up with ideas like the tabletop game that Craig was mentioning. And if we can, we will try to make them happen. Also, will shift so much the conclusions that you're asking your audience to draw from the work, right? Because I think that's the one thing about a textual paper is it's like a streamline. You're taking people from point A to point B, whereas something like a walk is a different experience. And then a game is actually an open system where if it's depending on how it's constructed and played, um, you, don't, you don't know what the outcome will be, which is so reflective of your, your methods, I think. Yeah, and, and having a whole bunch of options around also allows you to think about what kinds of presentation are appropriate for certain kinds of objects, right? Um, not everything works as a game, um, but some things might work really well as a game, and they might also work as text, but what, yeah, what comes of that experience of engaging with the text or engaging with the game or a film um, is something that that remains entirely open, which is great. Okay. So actually, there is uh, something we can show you that is related to that table. <laughs> <laughs> so there are oh, yeah. two things here. Oh, sorry. Oh, here you go. Did you want to do this? No, no, go for it. Okay. So there are two things here. 
that uh, we put them together, but they're not related. So uh, first here, it's um, like a small maquette, if you can see, that is exactly the seating area that is there. And this was done by um, a group called Best Concordia, which is also from the ethnography lab. And they're working on a podcast. They've been working on this podcast for about four years, I'd say. And um, they did uh, stop motion using these. This is really interesting as a material object. The other thing uh, that I was talking about would be these two boxes that are light boxes. And if you can see, there's like, from when the table was made, uh, there's a smaller version of the table. There is still leftover material that we use to make the table. Some of the wood shavings have uh, things written on them. Craig, are, are you familiar with what's written on them? <laughs> and like the, the usefulness of um, the the representations that we produce and how scale affects that. So uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up uh, the map makers. Yeah, because we've dealt a lot with maps and making maps, learning how to make maps have, has been one of our practices, right? Um, we've ended up with all kinds of sort of weird uh, questions about what maps are. Um, another thing that we just pulled out of our of our cabinet was, was some of the leftovers of our map making for the for the waterways project. So I showed you before the um, uh, what we came up with digitally, but that started out with things that we were just sticking on the wall um, all over the place. And we called them Franken maps because it was a total mess at the time when, that we made it. Um, and one of the things that we realized is that as much as you could think maps in a really interesting way by just sticking stuff to the wall, you still ended up with this kind of two dimensionality that was very difficult to very difficult to deal with. And so this is why we ended up going to the kind of digital format where you could interact with it in different kinds of ways. Um, but I'm still I still very much uh, uh, love these these two dimensional maps that we could spend all kinds of very embodied time with trying even trying to figure out how to make them stay up on the wall <laughs> within the within the confines of what we were allowed to do to the infrastructure here. <laughs> If we have any questions. Yeah, can I, can I jump in with a question? Sure. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Craig and, and everyone there. I'll just, I'll just read a question from the chat for you. Um, going back to something that you spoke to earlier, when working with human participants, how do you approach them in the way that creates a non-hierarchical, extractive, um, and rather reciprocal relationship? One of you want to <laughs> deal with that? Um, it's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably going to be able to. I can try. Yeah. Um, I think that the question is about. So it's a really loaded question. I am not sure that I can answer it, but um, a good place to start would be to ask the people you're talking to or the people you're studying what they're comfortable with what their comfort level is, what they want to divulge and like not to pressure them to actually um, tell you things that you want to hear because you came with a hypothesis, but instead to listen to them. Even if, uh, even if you're studying your own community, for instance, I'm studying my own community. And um, even if you suspect that something they're telling you doesn't align with what you know, or if you suspect between parentheses that they're lying, for instance, you don't push that forward. You just take it as it is. you note it, you say that, that's what they told me. This is one of the ways. Uh, of course, this isn't uh, everything I say is to be taken with a grain of salt because <laughs> I, uh, I don't know everything. <laughs> I, I can say uh, one other thing about that, which is just, well, maybe two things. So one is that um, the hierarchical nature of, of uh, interviews or, or of some kind of participant um, relationship isn't always one way, right? So we've been uh, in the Waterways Project, we've dealt with a lot of people who are politicians who actually in many ways have more power than we do, right? Um, and then the question of how, how you relate within that space suddenly starts to shift 
and what your responsibilities are to people starts to shift. And, and what's important about that and what's important about doing that kind of work in which the hierarchies change and are reversed is that it makes you very aware of what kinds of dynamics are, are at stake when you're, when you're doing something like that. And so there are plenty of places where you may not, the, the kind of ethics of your engagement may not be nearly as important as in other places where you're dealing with more vulnerable people where you have to think about this stuff, right? And, and this is one of the things that I think uh, a good training and, and a lot of practice in doing this kind of research with different kinds of people um, allows you to be sensitive to. Uh, but that sensitivity and that empathy and that al uh, allowing oneself to be vulnerable in different kinds of ways, um, I think is, a, is absolutely key and, and you know, should have been key to the practice from the beginning and probably was for a lot of people, but not always in the way that it gets written down in the canon of, of a, a discipline, right? And so those are definitely elements of the practice that we try to constantly um, reinforce here. Um, Thank you. And uh, I think Joya also had a, a question. Go ahead, Joya. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for this lovely visit. It was great. Um, my question revolves around something that we talked about earlier. So I would like to know how the interactive aspect of video games multiplies the possibilities in ethnography studies. I love this question. And not just because this is what I'm fascinated about and what I'm working uh, with. But basically, uh, in terms of video games or tabletop games more traditionally, uh, you think about it as a software that someone puts out and then that's it. But at the same time, um, a video game continues to be made regularly all the time, even if you don't have updates for it. Because it uh, again, it embodies some of the experiences and some of uh, the lived uh, feelings and uh, everything uh, of that sort of the people who are playing it as well. So the video games that you put aren't just uh, their content. The video games aren't just their author with all their political agendas or causes that they're trying to put in, into them. The video games are also who plays them. So uh, this is one way of, of me thinking about it and continuously uh, and constantly um, evolving the research. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm just waiting to see if there are any final cues here in the chat, uh, giving people a second to gather their thoughts. And, and if not, perhaps Cecilia has something she'd like to end with. And um, something I think we've touched on with other students that are you open to visits? Do you have any kind of contact with the student body that if interested students might follow up? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so Melina here is our lab coordinator, and um, she, her email is up on our website. Yeah, so Concordia Ethnography Lab uh, has a has a website you can find easily, um, and just email the regular uh, site if you if you're interested in becoming part of any project. We are we are really open to anyone coming in, and the only the only stipulation really for lab membership is becoming involved in one way or another in one of the various projects. So you can uh, you can write to us and find out what's going on. Um, you can also pitch ideas. This tabletop idea with someone who out of the blue emailed and said, I want to do this. Are there people there who'd be interested in working with me? And, uh, and we're going with it because it seems like a great idea. So, um, so we're, we're very open to people from whatever background um, who, who think this is a thing they would be interested in engaging with. Um, we're, yeah, we're, we're just here having fun. All right. <laughs> Thank, well, thank you. you. Thank you so much for that open invitation uh, to come and join and work. That's really much appreciated. And thank you for taking the time to come in on a rainy Monday morning as a team and walk us through some of your ideas and projects. We've all really appreciated here behind the scenes watching this. And I'm sure the folks watching later on YouTube will have uh, enjoyed this moment as well. So thanks for allowing us uh, into your space with you in this virtual manner. I guess uh, I'll say goodbye and and thanks again everybody have a great rest of the day thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time for the next episode thanks craig and everyone who's bye. joined thanks. you today bye bye, bye, -bye.